Hello, everyone, and good morning uh, from Los Angeles. Uh, welcome to the Zoom presentation of uh, Bringing the Middle Ages to Life, Reenactments and Costuming uh, with Janty Yates and Scott Farrell and moderated by Kate Stevenson. Um, and just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, closed captioning has been enabled uh, to access live captioning. Just click the CC icon on your Zoom menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, and of course, if you have any questions for uh, our panel of speakers, please put them into the Q&A box um, and we will get to those toward the end of the program. Uh, we'll reserve some time for them. So definitely pop those in there as they occur to you. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Larissa Grolamond. I'm Assistant Curator of Medieval and Renaissance Manuscripts at the Getty Museum. Um, and can I please have the next slide, please? Um, this program uh, dovetails really nicely with a current exhibition that's on view um, at the Getty Center, The Fantasy of the Middle Ages. Um, this show and its accompanying publication look at really all the ways that the Middle Ages has been reimagined over many centuries, really since the medieval period. And um, one part of that uh, is, of course, the live action Middle Ages. Um, and the live action Middle Ages, as I'm thinking of them today, kind of encompass everything from contemporary reenactment to costuming and to the movies and television and the way that the period is brought to life through visual cues. Um, can I please have the next slide? Um, so there are a handful of objects that I just want to introduce to you briefly before I introduce our speakers. Um, things in the exhibition that kind of dovetail really nicely with this idea of bringing the Middle Ages to life. Um, and this has really been a process that's been really crucial to the visual recreation of the historical period for audiences outside of that period. Um, and this has really been happening since the medieval period. So um, if you look at the tournament book uh, in the upper right part of your screen, there are already jousts and reenactments of medieval combat happening in the 16th century and really going on through the 19th and even 20th and 21st centuries, of course, you may be familiar with things like medieval times and jousts at Renaissance fairs, for example. Um, this is happening already in the 19th century, the tournament at Englinton at the top of your screen. This is a 19th century reenactment of a medieval battle. It's basically 19th century medieval times where all the participants are dressed in medieval uh, garb and kind of aiming to channel the spirit of the period. Um, and of course, costumes are a huge part of this as well. So thinking about the ways in which uh, costumes really speak to character development, but make the period of the Middle Ages and often the European Middle Ages really present and really palpable for contemporary audiences. It's happening already in photography in the 19th century, and then beginning with the you know, first Hollywood blockbusters uh, in the 30s and through the 40s and 50s, um, where costume is playing such a huge role in laying the foundations of what we think of as the medieval. Um, and so with that, I will introduce our speakers. Um, our moderator today is uh, Kate Stevenson, who received her PhD in medieval history from the University of Notre Dame. She focuses on uniting oh, Notre Dame. I said that like a like a medievalist. Um, she focuses on uniting scholarly and popular ideas about the Middle Ages, and her writing has appeared in print printed in online outlets like Medieval Warfare Magazine, Medievalist.net, um, and the forthcoming Journal of Viator. Most recently, she is the author of How to Slay a Dragon, if we get that next slide, uh, A Fantasy Hero's Guide uh, to the Real Middle Ages. This handbook offers solutions to common challenges of epic fantasy novels and role-playing games, such as how to save the princess and what to do if the princess wants to save herself, um, with actual history from medieval Greenland to Germany and Persia and beyond. Um, our panelists are Scott Farrell, who's the creator and director of the Chivalry Today educational program founded in 2003 with the goal of exploring the history, literature, and philosophy of the code of chivalry from the Middle Ages to the modern world. He has written extensively on the image of knighthood and the ideals of chivalry for print and online publications as diverse as the New York Times, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust blog, and the book Martial Arts and Philosophy. 
Um, this summer, in conjunction with the Getty Center's Fantasy of the Middle Ages, Scott and the Chivalry Today team will be putting on demonstrations of armored and unarmored medieval fencing as part of the Artist at Work program on August 14th. So definitely check that out if you're in L.A. And then finally, uh, Janty Yates has been working in films and television since 1979 with many varied projects set in many very varied periods and for a variety of directors. Um, she became a, came in HOD costume design in 1988 and had a collaborative relationship with Sir Ridley Scott since 1998, where the great success of Gladiator, uh, for which she won an Academy Award. During her collaboration with Sir Ridley Scott, Janty has worked on diverse films such as Hannibal, American Gangster, Kingdom of Heaven, Robin Hood, Prometheus, Exodus, Gods and Kings, The Martian, Alien Covenant, All the Money in the World, The Last Duel, House of Gucci, and most recently, Napoleon. Uh, she is a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences, uh, the Costume Designers Guild, and also BAFTA UK. Uh, so please welcome uh, Kate, Scott, and Janty, and I will go ahead and turn it over to you guys. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Larissa, and um, thank you also to you and the Getty for curating such a beautiful and really thought-provoking um, exhibit. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with Scott and Jonti today um, because, you know, I can talk and write about the Middle Ages all I want and I want, but there's something about like the visual that has a special power to really bring the Middle Ages to life, bring an entire world to life. You know, I've always said like, it's a lot easier for me to talk to people about medieval Europe or even the medieval Near East than it is 18th, I don't know, 18th century Ethiopia, whatever. Because when I say medieval, you automatically are imagining something, imagining a world, and it's probably primarily visual. So, you know, whether it's, uh, I don't know, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy or even something like Disney's Aladdin based on the Arabian Nights, a medieval text, by the way. Most of us have some idea of what, you know, medieval means. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today, what medieval means today versus or including what it used to mean um, and what what life was like, you know, different the different times and places in the Middle Ages. Like, hey, there's probably no more important symbol or immediate symbol of the Middle Ages than the knight in shining plate armor, right? But the era of plate armor actually coincides with the European introduction of gunpowder and the printing press, which are two things that are about as far from our conception of the medieval as you can get. And since I personally am actually a lot more comfortable talking about the printing press, I'd like to turn this over to Scott, who can um, talk about what knights in shining armor have meant in the past and today. Well, thank you, uh, Kate. Um, happy to happy to start us off here. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm going to start us with uh, a little bit of uh, a discussion of something that we very, uh, very much start, uh, very much associate with uh, the Middle Ages, both sort of visually and viscerally, which is uh, medieval sword fighting. Um, so, give me a moment to bring up uh, my. Uh, slideshow and we will get that started. There we go. That's not the one, that's the one. There we go. Good. Uh, is, is that is that showing for everyone? The fantasy of sword fighting in the Middle Ages? Yeah. Yes, excellent. All right. Well, our fantasy of sword fighting in the Middle Ages comes from a variety of sources. Uh, certainly from Hollywood, where choreographed fights need to be as dramatic and sensational as possible. From Renaissance fair culture, where acrobatics and dirty tricks, flaming weapons and howls of pain and fury uh, seem to bring historical spectacle to life for the audience. And for lack of a better term, sword fighting sport activities, where practitioners, whether in medieval garb or modern protective equipment, test their skills in competitions that mirror the structure of golf, tennis, or karate competitions. To get medieval on something is a phrase that has become synonymous with blind, unrestrained animal savagery, abandoning any shred of compassion, civilization, or decency uh, in, in, the, in the goal of, of winning. Uh, our fantasy of medieval sword fighting invites us to get medieval in this way and 
that's not entirely off target. Uh, there was plenty of raw brutality to go around in medieval warfare. But thinking of knights in armor of the Middle Ages fighting always in anger, always to the death, always employing techniques that are based more on blind rage than technical skill, gives us an impression of medieval knights and their arms, armor, training, and culture that can lead us far afield from historical reality. And I'm going to put an asterisk uh, right there by reality that we'll get back to in just a moment. So what might give us cause to question that fantasy of medieval swordplay? And once we start to draw back the fantasy curtain, what evidence can we use to give us a more authentic picture of medieval sword fighting? Well, over the course of the last 20 years or so, amateur scholars like myself have started to focus a great deal of attention on previously obscure historical documents, fact books, that is fighting books or fencing manuals from the late Middle Ages. These books written largely by Italian and German fencing masters described fighting methodology that was taught to knights, princes, and professional soldiers, but also to merchants and burghers, many of whom had risen to the level of the knightly class by that time, clerics, some of whom were teenage university students who might in fact get into drunken brawls or challenges of honor, and even women. The earliest fighting manual does in fact include a few techniques for a female practitioner. These fighting methods employ a wide variety of arms. Swords, yes, but spears, axes, daggers, batons, in armor and out of armor, wrestling on the ground, wrestling on horseback, how to deal with multiple opponents, how to throw a sword from a distance, fighting from the ground against someone on horseback. These are combative systems that are adaptive, subtle, complex, precise, and analytical. And the masters who wrote these books were clearly recording a style of fighting and training that was already well-established and respected. This wasn't something that they were inventing on their own in order to improve ineffective or outdated fighting techniques. This is the style of fencing that we try to study, interpret, teach, and practice in our classes, and to present to the public in demonstrations like the ones that we are putting on for the Getty as part of this exhibition. We try to get medieval in our sword fighting in a way that gives spectators a glimpse into historical reality, with that asterisk I mentioned earlier being that we are making a determined effort to reproduce the equipment, techniques, and tactics as they are described in the historical source material. The result may not be perfect, but we don't have any video or any sort of recording of an armed encounter from history to check our results against. Admittedly, chronicles of real duels, tournaments, and other applications of swordplay are sketchy at best. But examining these encounters, the context, not just the techniques of medieval sword combat, can give us a way to check our results in somewhat of a broad sense. For example, one of the best documented duels, the so-called last duel between Jean de Carroge and Jacques Legree, is described with a frustrating lack of blow-by-blow -blow details in five historical chronicles. Only two of the written accounts were authored by people who had actually seen the duel, and those were written years after the event took place. Maybe it was fought on foot, maybe it was fought on horseback. Maybe the combatants used swords or maybe axes. Maybe it was a quick event or maybe the combat lasted for hours. We know the outcome, but we don't know how the encounter unfolded in the moment. Similarly, we have some very murky understandings of medieval tournaments. And there was a very thin and often fuzzy line between contentious duels and friendly tournaments in the medieval world. But that's a topic for another talk. However, uh, something for something that drew a huge amount of attention and prestige in the medieval world, we have very little details about fine points of medieval tournaments and jousts. We know they were popular both among the knights who took part and the throngs of people from all stations who came to watch them. We know they included a lot of pageantry and theatricality. In fact, some description of tournaments sound a lot more like what we would call live action role playing games. And we know that despite the risks involved, or perhaps because of the ever-present risk of injury and death, participants who faced each other as rivals in a tournament competition often came away as lifelong friends. But what we have little detail about is, how were they scored? What were the rules? What tactics and strategies did successful knights employ in order to win? Accounts of medieval tournaments go into agonizing detail about what sort of fashions the knights wore as they arrived, 
how many horses and squires they brought with them, who was in the stands watching the events, what was served for dinner at the feast afterwards. But in our minds as modern sports fans, we yearn for information about these nightly sports that gives us enough detail to be able to appreciate the contest on the same level as any other sport we might watch and cheer for on a Sunday afternoon. One of the demonstrations we did a few years ago, uh, I was talking to, about jousting with a guy who wanted to know how the sport is practiced today and who was definitely approaching jousting as kind of a league style sporting contest. What he wanted to know was the equivalent of hitting a bases loaded home run or shooting from behind the three point line. And I explained that in a jousting competition, the highest value target on the opponent, the thing that you are trying to hit as the horses canter past is the shield. So he asked, do you try to hide your shield behind you and make it harder for your opponent to get a high score? Well, it's not an unreasonable question for someone approaching this as a modern scoreboard style sport. But achieving the highest score wasn't the prime goal historically. The tournament was rather something of a proving ground for chivalric character, being willing to show up, being ready to bring your best onto the field, to meet your opponent as respectful equals, and walk away without abandoning your sense of dignity, composure, and honor was what made for a remarkable co competitor, not having the highest point tally at the end of the day. In a duel, it was not unheard of for the Lord overseeing the trial by arms to call for a halt in the proceedings once the two appellants had stepped onto the field, armor on and swords in hand, and render a judgment without a blow being struck. Honor had been served, both knights had demonstrated their resolve and fortitude, and so they could accept a third party judgment without either one being seen as backing down. In tournaments, after a day, or in some cases after weeks or months of strenuous competition in armor, the lords and ladies witnessing the event awarded highest honors, not infrequently, to a knight who had fallen or been defeated in the competition. Standing against skilled, experienced opponents, rather than looking to score sure, easy victories, and perhaps even accepting defeat graciously and humbly, was seen as a show of the highest spirit of chivalry. The 14th century knight and author Sir Geoffrey de Charnay, himself a veteran of the Hundred Years' War, summed up this spirit of renown with the phrase, he who does more is of greater worth. To be worthy was, was perhaps the greatest praise a knight could achieve, something they knew when they saw, but was difficult to define in terms of points scored, tournaments won, or hits made in a sword fight. All of us who take part in the historic fencing arts are, on some level, participating in the fantasy of the Middle Ages. We are not, and never will be, truly putting our lives on the line when we take up arms, as medieval knights did every time they took sword or lance in hand. But the more we can peer through the gloom of historical mythology and illuminate the realities of that world, including the documented techniques of armored sword fighting, the more depth and realism we can add to our own medievalism. The more we know about the techniques, applications, and cultural context of medieval swordplay, the more we can make our fantasy of the Middle Ages less about dragons and magic and fantastic quests, and more about seeing our own struggles and joys and accomplishments reflected in the images of the medieval world that emerges from our explorations into the past. Well, hello. Um, I thought I was going to be in a discussion with Kate, but I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I've got my mute button off and I've got my video working. Um, I'm just going to tell you about the three films I've done that were set in medieval times. The first one was Kingdom of Heaven. And that was basically the crusaders who took off on the, I think it was the 11th crusade. Basically they, were marauders. I think Scott would agree with me. They went down. The Saracens were living in complete harmony with Jews, with the Moors in Jerusalem. They were perfectly fine until crusaders from England, France, Scotland, you name it, they whoever could raise the money and raise the troops, they went off and they just marauded, I'm afraid. Um, however, this did not go down very well when the film came out. It was misinterpreted. It was um, sadly thought of as a kind of a 
ISIS type um, film, or certainly a film that was pro terrorism, which is very unfair and very un, un very unfair anyway. And we had a bomb on the set. Uh, we set we shot it in mainly in Morocco and in Spain. Um, that didn't harm anybody, but it was all quite, it all got quite nasty. Um, however, what I did want to say was that we invented plastic or urethane armor, and we invented plastic chain mail. Now chain mail is done very, if any of you have watched the making of Lord of the Rings, you can see that they actually do make the chainmail by hand. It's very painstaking, very labor intensive. And we had a collaboration with Weta Workshop and uh, which are the um, special effects company down in New Zealand. They installed a factory in China with 2000 ladies and they just would send us mile upon mile of wonderful wonderful plastic chainmail that looked just like real chainmail. And then the urethane of the, of the um, armor is, it's all down to the paint effects, all complete. You can't have anything that's theatrical or operatic. You've got to have a bit of rust here and a bit of vernissage or the green that copper goes in another corner. And you've got to have scars and you've got to have a bit like a, Vietnam vet in, uh, in uh, the 80s and 70s, basically they would carve initials into their helmets, etc. And so we did all of that for Sir Ridley, which was his request. And it looked marvelous. It really did look wonderful. Um, if we go to the next, the first, first um, basically is King Baldwin, um, who had leprosy and he had this as a mask. He also had a very ornate mask and this is made of urethane, but it looks metallic, I think. Next slide, please. This is it just with the, the casing that goes under the helmet. And this is the helmet that he was wearing in the first slide. Urethane, pretty good. Next slide, please. And these are just some concepts of the characters. Odo was um, a right-hand man in his tunic. All of this chain mail we, had, we made up. Well, that was very, very, labor intensive as well, making the sleeves, making the legs, making the whole halberks, making the hoods, but it just worked so brilliantly. Next slide, please. This was Godfrey of Ibelin, who was played by Liam Neeson. He had actually, he had chain mail. He didn't have these big petals that you see, but he had fake fur lined cloak and uh, a helmet similar this but our nose guards did not last urethane um the nose guards got thrown around a bit and just came off but you can see here how the whole of the chainmail um hood has an aventail which has just covered the mouth and that's it open and that's it closed of course next slide please this is Guy de Lusignan, who played um, Eva Green, who was Sibylla, Queen Sibylla, played her husband. He wasn't really king, but he was very bad in the film. He was extremely bad. All the Templars wore cream tabards, cream cloaks with red crucifixes on them. And he had plastic chainmail from top to bottom. Literally, they, we bound it around their boots. Next slide, please. This was David Thewlis as the hospitaler. The hospitalers all wore black with white crucifixes. And uh, again, same concept of a helmet, again, in urethane. 
Next slide, please. This is Salah Hadin, who is played by Ghassan Masood. We did the most exquisite armor for him. It was black, like a honeycomb. You can see it in the top corner. It was black and it was edged in gold. It took weeks and weeks to do. Um, and the Saracens had just such exquisite fabrics. Um, and we just went to town on uh, Salah Hadin who was actually a pretty good fellow, believe it or not. Next slide, please. Firouz was his sidekick. Um, he didn't last long in the film, sadly. And uh, he has a platelet cuirass, which again was made, I think, out of urethane. It might've been leather, but I think it was urethane. Next slide, please. Saracen infantryman, we have We have a beautiful helmet here with so much exquisite engraving and the spike. We also have, and this was one of Salah Hadin's unfinished gilded. It was actually finished in black with the gold. They just got as far as gilding it, sadly, and I don't think we ever used it, but it was used we would have to get seven or eight of them because you'd need the stunts, you need clean, you need muddy, you need the stunt one, clean, stunt one, muddy, and then bloody. So you'd have to have six to eight helmets. I think that was just one I was able to bring home with me. Next slide, please. This is Balian, <clears throat> who was played by Orlando Bloom, and it was just him at the forge, just a concept, pure linen hand sewn, hand leather worked belt, hand leather work boots, and he'd have a binding of leather around his wrist and around his knees. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Saracen cavalrymen, they had the most wonderful, literally padded dresses. They were wrap over, Diane von Furstenberg, and they were padded and underneath they'd wear an arming jacket and they'd have britches as well. And he's got platelets on his cuirass, which is called Lamala. Next slide, please. This is Balian's first armor. His halberk is totally plastic chainmail, and the rest is fairly self explanatory. You can see the chainmail in the corner. Handmade by Chinese ladies. Next slide, please. Saracen infantry, there's another wonderful pattern of the uh, wrap cloak or coat that they would wear. Next slide, please. These were just chain mail. <clears throat> chain mail was really only worn by middle classes because the lower classes, the real grunts of the war, basically could not afford it. So they would just wear the padded arming jacket and hope for the best. That would be their protection. Next slide, please. Army of Jerusalem, chain mailed up to the hilt, tabard and the crests are so important. The crests would follow through onto the, obviously onto the shield. Next slide, please. Saracen infantry. Now this cuirass was, we actually, again, made them and molded them. It was leather and it was beautifully engraved leather, strips of leather. And uh, we found an original in a museum and we copied it and then we molded it. So we didn't actually make them in leather. We made the originals in leather, but they were very good because they were very tough and they could deflect arrows. Easy, next slide, please. This is gorgeous, Sibylla. Well, my director mentioned Alma Tadema for um, the ladies of Kingdom of Heaven. And uh, so we used the colors and we used the fabrics and uh, she has, she's got everything going on here in actual fact. Um, this is just a concept. I think there's one drawing of her where you can see a photo. Next slide, please. 
Salah Hadin and his weekend <coughs> was really what he'd wear in the evenings or whatever, if we were seeing him in his home, which we did two or three times and Ridley just wanted him in black. So that was a concept unused, although we made the um, gowns. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, we, we've talked about him, we can move on. There's a different helmet there. This was him at war, again, the most superb, wonderful cuirass in black and gold, which is just an early concept here. You can see the black and gold at the bottom. Next slide, please. Oh, here we have Sibylla, <clears throat> the concept and her in actual costume. And we have Jeremy Irons, who I haven't credited, his concept and him actually in the full um, tabard cloak and he had chain mail. I remember when we were fitting all the actors, the fittings would take about five hours because all the chain mail had to be laced up in, with leather thonging. Next, please. And this is Balian, King Balian, Ed Norton again, um, with his mask. And he just goes out to war once and he's dripping in gold, but he has the Christian um, Christian um, crest on his chest. Thank you. And that's, I think, it for Kingdom of Heaven. And we just can move on to the last duel, which um, Scott mentioned, um, <laughs> saying that it was not really very well <laughs> documented because it was much, much later. But it is actually a film about the very last duel that I believe was legal. I think all the other duels came at five in the morning quite illegally in some sort of clearing in a forest. And that's why it was always held then. But Scott can probably, um, after this, correct me. Next slide, please. We can just run through Jodie's looks. These are concepts. They're a little bit too glamorous. In fact, we dressed her down in a lot of linen um, because she was Madame de Carouge. She was Matt Damon's wife. And she basically ran the estate when Jacques de la, Jacques, Jean de Carouge, sorry, excuse me, confusing my Jacques and Jeans. Um, Jean de Carouge went off to war, which he did a lot because he was always broke always needed more money and would always go and fight and always survived. So we can go through this, these concepts. Next slide, please. This red dress we made, it was a reaction that Ridley wanted from uh, Matt Damon when he comes back from fighting. She's made an effort, he's furious. Next slide, please. Just working on the estate. Next slide, please. An event, just, you know, we never actually made this dress, but it's very much of her dressed up look. Next slide, please. This is the French queen who was married to um, King Charles VI, who was played by Alex Walter. And the next slide is also a concept for the French Queen. Then we come on to the next slide, which is Matt Damon. We did make these. You can carry on next slide and the next slide. This was very much how he wore his clothes around his small, rather modest castle. And then we have slightly flashier Adam Driver as Le Gris. And he starts off very much a humble squire and he gets favored by the uh, the next in line to the king and he ups his look and ups his ante next slide please so you can see he's uh, a bit more glam and then his battle their battle uh, battle armor and their dual armor comes up next next slide please so this was Matt's, this was Carouge's full armor, all urethane. We took this from 
a set of armor, original armor from the Met in New York. And Ridley fell in love with the um, fact that it had this canvas cuirass to it. We didn't do the red helmet. We actually did a helmet with a half um, visor because we thought visors were essential, but you couldn't see they were actors. So that's film reel and real reel. We did half visors. Next slide, please. This was his very simple battle armor, which he used a lot and was much dirtier than this. And that was his helmet. And then we come on to the next slide, please, which is Adam Driver, Legree's very similar to the um, red of uh, Carouge, um, canvas, blue, um, but obviously you could tell them apart. Um, and again, the whole design taken from the, uh, the armor that we discovered in the Met. They have an amazing collection of, uh, of full armor, all urethane. And then his battle uniform, uh, sorry, battle armor, next slide please, is this one, which was just a lot more ornate. We took this from an effigy um, in a country churchyard in Suffolk um, with the, the ropes and the, the circles. He was a lord, some, somebody. And that's it really. That's just talking through my slides anyway. I can talk about the last duel um, till we're blue in the face, but basically I think I've used up enough of your time. Uh, is my video working yet? There we go. All right, thank you so much, Scott and John. Dude, that was absolutely amazing. Um, I am seriously going to have to up my Halloween costume game this year. I'm actually kind of embarrassed at this point, <laughs> sitting here <laughs> seeing all of that. Um, so anyway, um, we've got a few questions from the audience, but one thing I just, I'm curious to you know, Scott, you said that um, your participants aren't risking their lives every single time they show up for, you know, a, a modern tournament. If I show up for one of those, say, am I wearing like, am I wearing Jaunty's plastic plate mail and urethane armor? What have I got on and how badly do I want to take it off? Uh, well, sort of, a, sort of a, a nuanced answer to that question. Um, so there's a little bit of a spectrum in, in armor in medievalism. I'm going to use that term as we sort of are defining it here as part of the exhibition. Um, you know, on one hand, I mentioned uh, like medieval style sports competitions. And so reenactment groups like the, the Empire of Adria or the Society for Creative Anachronism um, will do kind of sword fighting games. And as long as you generally look the part, um, you, you absolutely could take part. And in fact, interestingly, uh, Jaunty, when she talks about the urethane plates for that lamellar armor, I think, uh, don't 100%, you know, quote me on this one, but I think it was when Hollywood started making those urethane plates for film work that reenactors discovered, oh, I can get these metal, uh, these metal textured plastic plates and make pretty much weightless armor that's relatively protective against a, a blunt instrument like a stick or a sword and I can go and fight in that rather than heavy metal armor, I'm in, right? So, um, so some, you know, it's a great example of like film and theatrical armor uh, kind of carrying over into the reenactment world where again, the, the costumey appearance of the armor works perfectly well as long as it actually protects you from getting hit. Now that, that's not necessarily a goal in film usage because boy if an actor gets hit in a in, in filming uh you know that that's a failure uh, but you know in, in a reenactment where you might be competing in a sword fighting competition uh and you can you can hide that plastic under a tabard or you have plastic that looks like metal great on the other end of that spectrum for what we do that's a little more what i would deem living history where the goal is to understand the the, the combatives techniques 
And part of that understanding is, is really understanding what the limitations and the effects that the armor has on you. We need that armor to be as realistic as possible. So 70 pounds of, of armor, like we were wearing this last weekend at, at the Getty, 70 pounds of armor, well, it's, it's not a dead weight, but it does restrict your movements in certain ways. And it helps you to understand why they might be training to use their swords in a specific way that if you are unencumbered, you might not understand. Uh, why, do, why do you keep your arms down low? Oh, well, you, you, know, you put 10 pounds of armor on each, on each arm, you understand why you don't raise your arms up very high, uh, that, that sort of thing. So, uh, and, and in terms of wanting to get it off, um, uh, understand also, we're talking about a style of protective equipment armor that was made for a European climate, not Southern California. Um, uh, so I did an experiment a couple of years ago. We were doing some demonstrations kind of in the summertime. It was a little warm here in Southern California. Temperatures getting up into the 90s. And I thought, how safe is this really? So I took my helmet. I put it out on my patio on a sunny afternoon. It was 90 degrees. I left it there for 10 minutes and then took a surface thermometer to the armor, 130 degrees. So you are in a solar oven uh, made of, of polished high carbon steel uh, with a heavy winter jacket underneath it. Uh, and, and that's what you're, you're trying to fight in. So in, in a nice warm sunny day, yeah, you, you want to get out of that pretty quickly. And don't forget Jerusalem is always a high temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, which is really one of the reasons why those Saracens had uh, had that beautiful silk under undergarment underneath armor that was largely made of mail or small plates. Lighter cloth can breathe fairly easily. The Europeans got down there with their heavy woolen garments and oh, started you know chucking armor right and left. Uh, not made for that climate. I cannot lift a steel chainmail halberd. I cannot. It's impossible. So how they, they must have lived in them, slept in them, day in, day out. We discussed this at great length as we were worried about. Actually, no. I, I mean, um, there's a one is, I can think of as like a right off the top of my head, one 13th section. 13th century text, text uh, Quest for the Holy Grail, it's an Arthurian one, where the knights, like this, the text is not, is not deep with the details, but when the knights get to a castle, oh man, it says they take that armor off right away. Yeah, like That's yeah. the first thing they do. And I've always been really struck by that detail. Mm. Yeah, you get a lot of accounts in, in battles and stuff of, of knights, you know, they're getting ready to go to war, getting ready to go to battle. They do not want to put that armor on until the last possible second. Uh, because it's hard to move in, it's hard to it's hard to do your daily business in it. Uh, but I mean, to Janty's point, you know, it was a world where that was their that that was their job, that was their existence. They trained for that the way that we would train the way, the way that we would participate in a full time career. You know, seven days a week, eight, mm -hmm. 10, 12 hours a day of just of just physical training, and it, you know, it was a world where you know. They didn't have machines and electrical equipment. Just existing was a much more physical, uh, was much more physically strenuous. Uh, and if you're, you know, there's, there's an illustration that shows knights uh, training where they're like tumbling and wrestling, where they're lifting heavy rocks, where they're climbing up the underside of a ladder. Uh, so yeah, there was certainly a lot of physical exercise and preparation, but, but the Excalibur kind of notion of, Knights like going to dinner in their armor and you know having you know conversations around a table in armor. No, they didn't want to do that any more than we want to wear that any more than we would want to wear you know hard heavy clothing around where you're trying to clean the house or have a nice dinner. Yeah. So in other words, I guess I kind of would be pretty ready to take it off. Yeah. Um, yeah definitely. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, so Scott was talking about um, how reading the fact you hear the, the fencing manuals has pretty much revolutionized our understanding of medieval combat. So, John G., I was wondering, like, you know, he's talked about his sources. I, you know, I study literature, but I was wondering, like, 
when you're sitting down to when you were sitting down to come up with the costumes for kingdom of heaven and then when you're trying to work with an entirely different era of costumes for last duel how did you re go about researching like what would be more accurate we um we always research and research and research and basically research has become much simpler this day and age however back then in 2004 the internet was not the tool it is now. And so obviously we were in libraries, we were in museums, we take quite a bit from art and so galleries as well, but books mainly, ancient tomes, and you have to research the granny out of it, as um, I always say, and then you can do a few twists. You can just tiptoe around things and just change things a little bit. Yeah, actually, and so this is this is one of the things that um sometimes some of the times we use the language authenticity versus accuracy, with accuracy being sort of the way it was in the Middle Ages, and authenticity being how we understand the Middle Ages were and how we react it. Um, so like basically, you know, knights in shining armor, plain mail, horses, mud. These are things that signal the Middle Ages to us, versus um. You know, like I like I mentioned, the printing press is 1450s Germany. That's medieval, but we don't think of it as medieval. Um, so, I for for both of you, I'm wondering when you try to steer towards something that is historically accurate, have you ever gotten pushback from people who say, "Well, wait a minute, that can't be medieval. That doesn't feel authentic." Um, I yeah. haven't, an actual fact, because we always really try our hardest to be as authentic as possible. And it's actually my director of these last three films who won, who's wanted to go a bit veering off the piste, as it, off piste as it were. Um, and he was going, why can't we give them a purple hat or something like that? And I go, no, no, no. And my whole team go, oh, shock horror. We've got to stay in the Bible. Um, so we do we do a little bit, but not very much. You know, like the Alma Tadema, who's totally, um, you know, eighteen ninety to nineteen ten. I think his uh, his work is um, very prevalent. Um, we used him as a color reference. We used a lot of artists as color references and lighting references. Um, so we take. We take it from everywhere and then we sit with it and stroke it and then out of that comes beauty, we hope. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Jaunty, Jaunty's description of how they come up with like costuming concepts uh, out of historical uh, documentation. I mean, you, you could take, take out costumes and put in sword fighting. That it sounds exactly like what we try to do. Um, you know, it does what we do. Does it look like what's in that historical illustration? Uh, and, and if not, how do we how do we steer it more towards that? Um, and yeah, we, we do get a lot of pushback, pushback, uh, you know, a lot of confusion from audiences who come wanting to see knights, you know, throwing mud at each other and, you know, kicking and snarling and doing flips and, and spins. And they see us uh, uh, you know, using these more historical techniques where you're holding the sword in both hands, where the sword is almost used more like a spear than a, than a cutting instrument. And, and they say like, well, well, that's, I mean, literally, that's not real sword fighting, is it? Uh, yeah, you know, this is much more, uh, this is much more in concert with the images of fighting than we see in these historical documentations, much more historically accurate but it doesn't seem authentic to them. Uh, you know, the, what, what they want to see is someone getting medieval, um, you know, in, enraged and, and, you know, flinging the sword around uh, wildly. Um, so yeah, I, there, there definitely is a little bit of a sense of, you know, that doesn't really jibe with their, with their conceived notion of what a medieval sword fight is going to be. Yeah, so so actually, this gets right into my my next question, which is basically, you know, Scott, you called your organization Chivalry Today, not you know, whacking people with swords. <laughs> so, so, what is Chivalry Today? 
I mean, what does the word, what does the idea of chivalry mean today versus what might it have meant in 2000, you know, versus what did it mean in 1800 versus, you know, how do we think of medieval chivalry? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I want to recognize that you know, there's a huge amount of cultural and social baggage that comes along with that word. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing a, uh, a talk on chivalry at, uh, I think it was a writer's conference. And afterwards, some, someone, a uh, woman came up to me and said, you know, you know, I almost didn't come to your talk because you titled it something that had to do with, uh, you know, with cultural repression, chivalry. And I almost didn't come to it. I don't know why you called it that. I'm like, whoa, chivalry is as, but oh, there is particularly these days sort of that notion of it is kind of a repressive or a you know, bigoted uh, kind, of, uh, kind of concept. We try to take it back to it's more, again, to use our, our terminology, it's more authentic version, not necessarily accurate, because in the Middle Ages, chivalry was really a concept that applied only to knights and members of their aristocratic social class. Being chivalrous to somebody who was of working class, eh, they, they wouldn't really have, uh, they wouldn't really have uh, embraced that notion. But again, to be authentic through the years, we have begun to see chivalry as something that can be practiced on a broader scale. I feel it is unfortunate that, that we immediately associate that with treatment of women, because in the Middle Ages, that would have been only a very small part of the concept of the code of chivalry. It was really a code of behavior for anything that a knight had to deal with in their lives, for military conduct, for uh, legal affairs, uh, for treatment of your, your um, you know, social and, and, and political uh, hierarchy. Um, so we try to bring it, bring it back to that sense of just, uh, just plain a, uh, a notion of how to live a good and worthy life. I, I feel that it is not uh, out of the, the bounds of, of reasonableness to assume that anyone today can be worthy of living by and being treated by the code of chivalry, not just those of knightly aristocratic class anymore. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, we, we, to bring this back to sort of our demonstration at the Getty, we sort of use the image of the deed of arms, a, a knightly presentation of, of combat in armor, as a metaphor for the, the struggles and the trials that we all deal with every day. There are tough things that we have to fight with on every level in our jobs, in school, and family. Chivalry can give us a way of how to approach that uh, in a way that is enriching, that is, um, that is ethical, uh, that, that gives us a framework of responsibility and, uh, and, and personal obligation uh, to go along with that. You don't have to pick up a sword in order to live by the code of chivalry today. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. And, and you know, and that's such a perfect example of, you know, as the exhibit is even, even called the fantasy of the Middle Ages, which is as much about, you know, our emotions towards the medieval and towards ourselves as it is about what the Middle Ages actually was. So this actually, um, I was wondering about, you know, Janti, you didn't really talk about Robin Hood, but this is in itself already a medieval fantasy, you know, a medieval fantasy of itself. Um, how does that, how do you go about doing the costumes for something like that versus something with, uh, you know, a solid historical grounding like Last Duel? Well, Robin Hood, um, we actually did very, very much um, research a similar era to Kingdom of Heaven. Um, Kate Blanchett's costumes were very, very um, elegant, but simple. Um, Russell's costume and the Merry Men, they were all leather and linen and hop sack. Um, the most beautiful costumes, I think, were the royal family, King John, um, who is played by Oscar Isaacs, and um, Leah Seydu, who played his wife, uh, who's princess, who knows what, I can't remember her name, to be honest, but basically we did some exquisite, exquisite, glorious, gold embroidered 
um, and bullion embroidered um, silks. It was total fantasy. And sadly, people were disappointed that it didn't have the laughs of the Kevin Costner one, and it didn't have the pranks. It was actually an origin story of Robin Hood, where he came from, why he became such a helper to the poor. And uh, nobody really liked that. <laughs> However, yeah. we, we, did, we did exquisite work on that film. Really, it's worth seeing for the costumes. Yeah, Robin Hood is a really interesting case because, you know, that's as much of a, it's become as much of a modern legend of it. Like, I don't know if um, you guys are familiar with like the DC Comics character Green Arrow, who even got, you know, a CW show for a while or the, or Alan Rickman canceling Christmas, as you mentioned, <laughs> or, or as we talked in our, in our, uh, you know, discussions before the event, the impeccably historically accurate BBC series. <laughs> so I'm not even going to discuss that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we should use that. This this is like the primary educational as, a, as the occasional thing. Um, but actually, so I was I, I was actually, not to do. Uh, yeah, well, we'll just set that inside its little box over there and let it grow. Um, we, so um, do you you know when you know it's something like that where we've imagined it so many different ways. What are some of your favorite depictions of the Middle Ages besides the ones that you yourselves have worked on? Are you, you talking to both of us? Yes, I am actually, because you know, as we as we say, you know, the only thing medievalists like more than criticizing movies about the Middle Ages is movies about the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lorraine Margot is very much um, oh god, yeah, paramount in my life. You know, it was the fabrics, the design, the whole film was just superb. You know, him bleeding from the face, just, it was just extraordinary how they worked that movie. It was genius, absolute genius. And it was so stimulating from um, a costume point of view, so stimulating. And it was really, it was our Bible to work you know, from not to copy, but to be stimulated and to bounce off from. Yeah, uh, Lorraine Margot was actually the movie that made me understand what the phrase costume drama actually meant. So. How wonderful was that film? Absolutely. How about you, Scott? Uh, so, I mean, your, your, your statement about you know, criticizing medieval movies and watching medieval movies, spot on, because I'm going to say, um, you know, I, I think for me, the most authentic, not accurate, authentic uh, medieval movie, Excalibur. Um, I think they did a great job of capturing what a medieval reader or listener would have envisioned Arthurian legend to be not realistic in any way and and i know that you know to, uh, in my crowd that movie got a lot of flack for you know oh well that's not realistic or they didn't wear that kind of armor in the dark ages and, but anybody who's read mallory you know that's that that's exactly what you know mallory presents as kind of the uh as as kind of the standard of arthur's fantasy medieval world and you know like you say yes they were they were creating a fantasy world of the middle ages even back in the middle ages uh so Excalibur great job of sort of of sort of really embracing that vision of the fantasy of the middle medieval world in the way that they created it um in for fact, our other our, topic um, of, sorry I was just going to if I could just jump in yeah. our um armorer because obviously you have an armorer to create the original armor for um, any film and then you take molds off it and urethane it but it was terry english mm -hmm. who created all the escalibur armor um yeah for that which film. which was which he made out of aluminum for that movie but uh, you know I, uh, for even that um that gives a is a great example of how uh costume creation you know can have an effect on the production because um i mean that 
the armor in that movie is really kind of famous for moving, right. uh, behaving, uh, looking like real armor in a way that, that plastic struggles to do. Um, so, you know, yeah, that's, you're right. That's, we do that, that armor plastic. is still very kind of iconic. Scott, we call it urethane because it's like car bumper. It's not like plastic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. But, but still, it, it, I mean, it, and whatever plastic you're making out of it, just it doesn't quite have the presence of metal and, and the movement of metal. And, you know, to that being said, even aluminum doesn't quite have the gravity of steel armor. You don't move the same way when you're wearing 10 pounds of aluminum versus 70 pounds of steel. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, please don't take this as a criticism, Jati, because I recognize I'm that a costume a designer... Yeah. <laughs> I, I wear I 70 it. pounds of steel. I don't move at all, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I recognize that a costume designer and an actor, their jobs are different. It, you know, it's not their job to be uncomfortable in armor. Um, you know, they, they are there to tell a story. Um, and, you, you know, and you can't do that when you're wearing 70 pounds of steel. So, you know, that, uh, I, I recognize that, you know, your goal in putting armor on someone is different from my goal. Um, sure. Yeah. Sure. So let me, let me finish up the last part of that question. Another film that I would definitely recommend, Robin and Marion. Um, it's an old 70s, maybe. I don't even know when it was made, 70s or maybe early 80s. Sean Connery Sean and, Connery. Uh, and uh, 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 Robert, uh, uh, who plays the sheriff of Nottingham in that one. Robert Shaw. There you go, Robert Shaw. That's who I meant to say. Uh, uh, just a, a, I think, a beautiful depiction of that Crusader era, arms and armor and world, and a style of fighting between these two old lions who are in their final days of, of glory. Uh, just a style of fighting that beautifully encapsulates the way two older knights uh, do battle with one another in just an, like a, a physically economical, and, uh, and, and restrained kind of way, uh, just wonderful. I, I, I really recommend that movie. And again, we come back to Robin Hood and the mm -hmm. role that that particular story has on the modern imagination. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so let's see. Um, Actually, Scott, we have a couple of questions for you about um, the logistics of actual medieval tournaments and competitions. So like where they, you know, what era are we talking about when we talk about, you know, the sort of um, who's more chivalrous than the other person tournament? Like where, where, where and when am I besides Burgundian weddings? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, well, uh, you know, the, we are talking about a uh, type of event that, that uh, evolved and and morphed uh, through you know 500 years or more or or more. Um, so it, it's really hard to kind of pin down. Well, when, when we say tournament or jousting, what do we mean? Well, that might have been really different in the 11th century versus the 15th century. Uh, you know, so different that it you know it, it doesn't even look like the same uh, the same activity. The the analogy that I like to give is like if we said ball game today. Oh, what does that mean? That could that could be many different things, um, and and they they sort of use that concept of tournament in much the same way. Um, what we are talking about it, specifically in our presentation is more of what a 14th or 15th century knight would have thought of as a deed of arms or a passage of arms, uh, where um, fully armored knights um, would have come to contest uh, in a way that was really meant to showcase their fortitude, their strength, their stamina, their ability to kind of maintain their cool, even in a possible or very likely life or death situation. Um, one, one of the things that like is, is really a contrast between often the dramatic portrayal of of sword fighting, particularly in something like a tournament, and the reality, reality in quotes, of, of what we get from, um, from period chronicles is, is how do they behave? So again, in, in theatrical sword fighting, we often see knights like losing their cool, snarling, roaring, throwing helmets at each other, um, acting in a very savage way. 
Savage would not have been a compliment in the Middle Ages. Uh, to act like an animal was to sort of lose your sense of, of civilization and personality. Um, so what we see in historical chronicles is much more praise for like knights who might receive a grievous, even potentially lethal wound and still be very calm and cool and continue to could take part in the competition, offer compliments and praise for their uh, for their competitors, um, and and to maintain that sense of of dignity and and uh, you know civilized behavior even in the face of of death. Um, so um, again, that's very much what we try to portray uh, to make our presentations of medieval sword work match that historical model. Again, that's like you say, we sometimes get kind of pushback from the audiences of, oh, well, how come you guys aren't insulting one another? How come there's not a black knight for us to boo for when, when he brings out his flaming morning star? And, you know, um, but, uh, but in, in a real authentic, potentially accurate medieval sense, they wouldn't have had any admiration for somebody who kind of lost it and lost their temper uh, in the middle of a competition. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. But the goal but it, was, but yeah, but that, but that wasn't the idea, right? right so I've yeah. got, I have per, for personally like one more thing I want to talk about, and um, I'm going to ask you both the question that I hate answering because this is my chance <laughs> to do it. So you know we're celebrating um ama an amazing exhibit. I'm I'm completely in love with, with both the idea of the exhibit and the specific pieces you know that Larissa cho helped choose for it. Um, called the fantasy of the Middle Ages. You know we're not talking about like the fantasy of the Reformation or <laughs> you know. Um, so what is it about the Middle Ages, or is there something about the Middle Ages that grasps people's imaginations more than other eras of history? And um, I think to make that more specific. Um, Jonti, maybe you could talk about what makes your medieval projects, is there anything that separates them from some of the other, you know, some of your other projects that like you've worked on stuff that spans millennia and, you know, real history, fantasy, science fiction, you've seriously done it all. And, you know, and, um, and Scott, you have a much more like in-depth and specific and personal interest in the middle ages so like is there something about medieval that you can that you can like pinpoint that's special well i think for me it was kind of a renaissance in a way because you do have your basic way of life and yet there's a huge amount of creativity coming through it's obviously not the renaissance because that was a little bit later um but there was the use of wonderful French fabrics, of silks, of leather, carved leather, in, in, um, beautiful um, stones, jewels embedded in belts and jewelry. It was starting to get very, very ornate. Um, it was just the burgeoning of creativity in costume, I think. It had come out of the dark ages and that was, what was so exciting? For me, I think there is an element of kind of having it, that moment of history where the world starts to look like something that's pretty familiar to us. If you look back into like ancient Rome or Greece or Egypt, those things look pretty different uh, from our world um, you know, in, 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 in today's sense. The Middle Ages starts to look an awful lot like the world today, with with merchants selling things and trade, and and uh, you know, sort of a, 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 a society that we can that we can kind of wrap our heads around. And yet, there is still that sense of adventure and kind of personal uh, personal duty and, and honor uh, that we that we might lose as we move forward from there. Um, it, at least again, it's sort of a in sort of a historical vision kind of sense, uh, right? No one thinks of George Washington going off on a quest, or uh, you know Abraham Lincoln standing with a with a, a, a lance to you know meet all comers for thirty days. Um, you know, this, so there's still that sense of kind of adventure and romance that goes along. It's it's just that moment in history where where there's there is the familiar 
but also kind of the exciting and, and the romantic coming together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, I, like you, I study the very end of the Middle Ages. So that's sort of my feeling as well about, you know, where, where the pull comes from is that it's so, we'll, we'll often talk about how, or historians will talk about how the Middle Ages is in one sense, the foundations of the modern world. And in the other sense, it's something in completely alien to us <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. that, you know, we'll never really grasp. So, um, all right, I have actually one more um, audience question. This is for Jonti, and uh, it is, where are all, the, you know, after the, after the fact, where are all these costumes <laughs> stored? Which uh, I take to mean, where can I personally steal all of them and wear them? <laughs> <laughs> well, tragically, we have to return them to whatever studio is making the film. So probably they go into their beautiful, um, museums and um, get displayed there, or they get shoved into a warehouse, which I have a feeling is more like it. And the amount of costume I have given birth to and have had to send to the orphanage, and you have to hope that your orphanage for your babies is going to be a nice orphanage and not a terrible orphanage. Well, you can definitely tell them all. You can definitely give them my email address the next time <laughs> they need someone to well, you're provide very a good nice. home. I think that's a very nice compliment. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you both so much. This has been amazing. And thank you again, Larissa, for this opportunity. I almost, I don't want to interrupt. I think we could talk about this stuff for hours and hours. And it's been such a fascinating conversation. Um, I just want to say thank you to to you, Kate, for moderating uh, this wonderful conversation and to Janty and Scott for sharing your expertise um, and your insights into this really rich topic. Um, and thank you to everyone on Zoom who joined us. Um, I hope that you get a chance to see the Fantasy of the Middle Ages, which is on view at the Getty Center until September 11th. Um, and there's plenty of stuff to check out online as well. Um, and keep an eye out for other museum talks, both online and in person. Um, and thank you again for joining us. And thank you to all of the, the speakers as well. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for hosting us. It's been a fun event. Thank you so much all around. Yeah, this is absolutely great. Bye, everybody.